Welcome, Valley family, to 2018. Real excited about this series that we're doing, kicking off uh, the new year. Uh, it's called Q&A. If you've been around Valley for a few years, you know this is, this is how we start out the year. Uh, in response to the surveys that everyone filled out uh, on Christmas Eve and our Christmas Eve services, we take the top five questions that you were wanting answered from the Bible, uh, and uh, we take a question each week for five weeks and call that our Q&A series. And so uh, we're kicking that off. This question that we're going to look at this week, number one question, wasn't even close. It was a slam dunk. More of you wanted to hear this uh, answer from the Bible than any other uh, question that was asked. Uh, even the write-ins, this was so far ahead of everything. And that question is, how do I cope with stress? So I think that might be telling us a little bit something about what we're all facing with. Facing, uh, how do I cope with stress? So if you have your Valley Christian Church app, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and open that up. Uh, because if you're not dealing with stress or coping with stress right now, chances are at some point in 2018 you will be. So you, you want to take notes and, and have this to be able to look back on. And, and as we, we answer this question, this is one of the things I love about this series is we go back to the Bible because the Bible is our practical guide for everything. And it really does speak to every experience, every issue in our lives. Uh, it's brutally practical. It's our handbook. It's our playbook for life uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. And so when we answer this question, how do I cope with stress? Well, we're going to go right back to Jesus. Because if there was ever anyone who dealt with stress, it, it was Jesus Christ. He's our example. And he gives us an example that we can follow. Uh, and so uh, really, as we look at these uh, principles, I want to share with you today eight principles for, for dealing with or coping with stress. Uh, if we'll apply these things to our lives this year and in the years to come, we'll experience a whole lot less less pressure, and a whole lot more peace of mind. Uh, but the choice is yours. The choice is mine. It's always a decision. Are we going to follow Jesus' example, or are we just going to kind of keep trying to do it on our own, and the pressure just mounts more and more and more, and the stress as well. So how do I cope with stress? Let's jump right in uh, right now. Eight principles for coping with stress. The first one is identification. Identification. You have to know who you are. That's, that's the first, probably the most important. If we don't get this right, the other seven principles aren't going to help us. So identification, know who you are. And it's pretty interesting in the Bible, specifically in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a number of I am statements, and it's a fascinating study to do sometime. In fact, maybe we'll do it in 2018 as a series, the I am statements of Jesus. But, but let's look at a couple of these, or a few of these rather, uh, that Jesus explains, this is who I am. He knew who he was. He knew who he was, identification. First in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. He showed us how to live life. And he says, I am the light of the world. And then in John chapter 10, verse 9, he makes another I am statement. He goes, yes, I am the gate. He goes, I'm the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Jesus is saying, this is who I am. He's saying it to you. He's saying it to me. He knows who he is. He knows what his true identity is. And then John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. These three things, this triplet, if you will. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He says there's no exceptions. I'm the only one. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And then in uh, John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. He's, he knows who he is. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you. And that's exactly what Jesus did for me as well. Through living a sinless life and laying his life down as a sacrifice in your place, in my place, as a substitute on the cross. That's what I deserved. That's what you deserved. But, but he substituted himself and sacrificed himself and rose again three days later. He's a good shepherd. He sacrifices his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and then in John chapter 10, just a few verses down, verse 36, it says, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the son of God? The religious leaders were saying that's blasphemy for you to say it because he made it clear. He's like, I am God's son. I am the son of God. After all, the father sent me 
uh, apart and sent me into, set me apart and sent me into the world. So he says, I am the son of God. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the son of God. And so this first principle, the other seven kind of uh, follow in line with this. But this first principle, identification, you have to know who you are. You have to know who you are, and could I put it this way? You have to know whose you are, who you belong to as well. I am a child of God. I'm not here by accident, but on purpose. I'm deeply loved by God, and I'm accepted by him, and he has a plan for my life. And because he put me here, I am significant. And because he put you here, you're significant as well. You're not an accident. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And to handle stress, we've got to know who we are. Until you handle this issue, every one of us is going to be hindered and held up by insecurity. Insecurity causes a tremendous amount of stress and a tremendous amount of pressure. So this first principle, identification. Jesus shows us the way. Know who you are and know whose you are. Then the second principle that that we see in the life of Jesus when we talk about how to cope with stress is dedication. Know who you're trying to please. Who you're trying to please. If you don't know who you're trying to please, you're going to try to please everyone. And there is no more, nothing that creates more stress and pressure than trying to please everyone. Think about it for just a minute. Jesus didn't please everyone. God doesn't please everyone. It's a total impossibility. And when we try running around trying to please everyone, we add pressure and stress to our lives. Again, Jesus is the example. Look at what it says in John chapter 5, uh, verse 30. Jesus here says, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just. Watch this now. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Who are you trying to please? Are are you trying to please God? Or are you trying to please the crowd? Are, Are you trying to please what society is saying? This is who you should be. This is what really matters. Who are you trying to please? Jesus made it clear. He goes, I'm not here to please myself. It's not selfishness. It's not self-centered. That doesn't work. He goes, I'm here to please the one who sent me. In fact, it's kind of interesting that that Jesus needed that affirmation even. In in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, we, we see that it says, A voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. I I think sometimes as parents, it's important for us to remember. I think sometimes as spouses, it's important for us to remember. I think sometimes as employers, it's important for us to remember that that people need affirmation. And we need to be able to say, you know what? You're doing a great job. I'm so pleased with you. I'm so proud of you. Jesus needed it. Two times in the Gospels, this is one of those. Two times in the Gospels, God interrupted and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If Jesus needed it, we need it too. And instead of looking at maybe what we don't get from maybe mom and dad or, or someone else, let, let's, let's look to God. Let, let, and let's make sure that we're communicating that affirmation to other people as well. If you don't know who you're trying to please, you'll cave into three different things. You'll cave into criticism, you'll cave into competition, and you'll cave into conflict. Criticism, competition, and conflict. If you don't know who you're trying to please, someone just criticizes you a little bit, all of a sudden you're trying to do all you can to please them. That may not be the voice you need to be listening to. Maybe the wrong voice. You'll give in to competition, always comparing yourself with other people. You know, why did they get this? Why, do, why am I getting the short end of the stick? All this stuff. Those are all signs that you don't know who you're trying to please. And the third one is conflict. It, it bubbles up conflict. Uh, because we strike out because we feel like we're getting the short end of the stick. We're, we're being overlooked. We're lacking in something. All because we're not dedicated the way that we should be, the way that Jesus was, where he knew who he was trying to please. See, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus told us what it's really all about, the, the dedication we need to have. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, above everything. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. What does that mean? L- live the way God tells us in his word and he will give you everything that you need. He'll provide for us everything that we need 
put God first. I, I like to say it this way, you've heard me say it before. Live for the applause of those nail-scarred hands. Those nail-scarred hands of Jesus. Live for the, the applause of one, those nail-scarred hands. Who you're trying to please. And so, starts with identification. Principles of coping with stress. Then I, a dedication. And then the third thing is organization. Organization. Know what you're trying to accomplish. It's so important in life to know what you're trying to accomplish. As, as many are, are you know, trying to walk out their new, re, new Year's resolutions. We talked a little bit about that last week in the special uh, start message. Uh, you know, just beginning the year off the right way, having goals and all. Organization. Know what you're trying to accomplish. So incredibly important. Jesus knew it. Look at what he said in John chapter 8, verse 14. He said, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. He's like, I know what my goal is. I I know what I'm here to accomplish. I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you don't know this about me. But Jesus not only understood who he was, not only did he know who he was trying to please, but he also knew what he was trying to accomplish, what he was sent on earth to accomplish. And so every day you and I live by priorities or we live by pressure. We, we either live by the priorities that we know this is what I need to accomplish, this is what uh, I want to accomplish, or we live by outside pressure or internal pressure to measure up to other people. You and I have to make that decision. We have to be organized. Busyness is not necessarily productivity. It's real, it's funny how sometimes we, we equate, if I'm really, really busy, then I'm being productive. Not necessarily, you could just be on the treadmill going nowhere, but spending a lot of energy. Busyness does not necessarily produce, does not necessarily mean productivity. In fact, I've heard it put this way before, preparation prevents pressure, but procrastination produces pressure. Preparation prevents pressure. But procrastination produces pressure. There's a lot of P's in that sentence right there, but, but hopefully, you know, you, you can walk out of here with that. Preparation prevents pressure, but procrastination, when we put it off, when we don't have goals, when we don't know what we're trying to accomplish, don't have that organization, it actually produces pressure in our lives. So, so these are great principles that we see from the life of Jesus. I know where I came from and where I'm going. He goes, I, I know what my goal is. I know why I'm here identification, dedication, organization. Then here's the fourth principle from the life of Jesus, concentration. Focus on one thing at a time. Focus on one thing at a time. I, I know that multitasking is like the, the big kind of, hey, I'm just here multitasking. You know what generally that means is you're not being effective at either one of the things you're working on by multitasking. It's about focus. Think about it for a minute. Think about like a a flame. You can take a flame, like if you have a gas uh, stove, a flame will heat the bottom of a kettle. You know, you're trying to boil some water for some some tea or something like that. That that flame, it'll heat the bottom of that kettle uh, because it's dispersed. But if you focus that and focus it, you know what, like a a laser focus, now it'll cut through metal. It's all about concentration. It's all about focus. Focus on one thing at a time. Jesus did this. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 42. It's pretty interesting. I'll read, read the passage and then I'll give you a little bit of understanding on it. It says, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place and the crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. There were times, you read this all throughout the gospel, that the crowd is like, we need you to do this, we need you to do this, there's so much need, all this. And Jesus would withdraw from the crowd because he knew, first of all, he was like, I, I can't lose my focus as to why I came. And, and there were just more and more needs, more and more demands on his time, but Jesus understood and he was focused and had concentration where he needed to have it. And then it's pretty interesting in the next verse, Luke chapter four, verse 43, look at how Jesus responds. But he replied, listen to the focus, the concentration, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too because that is why I was sent. 
He had to leave one town, all great kind of needs, all, all people demanding of his time. I need, we need you to do this, Jesus, all these things. And he said, I gotta go. Because my, my focus, my concentration is God sent me to preach the good news of the kingdom of God, not just in this town, in other towns as well. And he said, that's why I was sent. That's why I was sent. And so instead of the crowd responding to the crowd, all these things, all these, these, these expectations of Jesus, he understood, he had that focus. He knew why I was sent. Concentration. He was determined, he was persistent, and he was focused. So very, very important. And then here's the fifth principle that we see in the life of Jesus, delegation. Don't do it all yourself. You need to learn how to delegate responsibilities to other people. Delegate. Don't do it all on your own. Even Jesus didn't do it all on his own. He had to delegate. In Mark chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. And this is the disciples. He called them to himself that they would be with him, the scripture says. And then he sent them out. And that's where we get our word apostle from. When they're sent out, the disciples become apostles. Disciple is, is, a, is, is a pupil, really, uh, of, a, of a teacher. Uh, probably the best way to explain that. But then when he called them to himself to be with him, then he sent them out. That's the Greek word apostala. And it means to be sent out. And, and so he delegated responsibility. He delegated authority to others. And so delegation is, is a real important principle when it comes to coping with stress and managing stress. There's two reasons why you and I don't delegate. <laughs> I know none of us want to hear this. <laughs> two reasons why generally it's difficult to delegate. The first is perfectionism. We think the way we do it is perfect and no one can possibly do it as perfectly as we do. And the second reason is insecurity. We're afraid someone's going to do it better. So we don't want to give them a chance. But what that does, the pressure and the stress just mounts up more and more and more on me and more and more and more on you. I heard, I think it was John Maxwell. I've done a lot of uh, uh, reading through the years of books that he's written and I've heard him a few times live as well. He started as a pastor for over 25 years and now one of the top leadership consultants in, in the, well, I guess you'd say in the world. And he talked about the, the delegation principle and that was this, if, anyway, if you find someone who can do what you do 80% as well, let them do it. That's, that's the delegation percentage, 80%. If it's 80% the way you would do it, let them do it. Because no one's ever going to be perfect. You don't want them to be, Lord, I don't want anyone else to be Greg Williamson. I'm trying my hardest just to be Greg myself. But, but, but if someone else can do it, 80% is effective, 80% is fruitful, 80% is successful, let them do it. That's the principle of delegation. That's the percentages, if you will, to think about. And, and so don't let perfectionism, none of us are perfect. Why do we think anything we do would be perfect? It's never going to be. This sermon's not perfect, far from it. I've never preached a perfect one. And, and so perfectionism and insecurity are what keep us from delegating. But think about what Jesus did. Jesus was perfect, and what did he do? He delegated. He was perfect. None of us will be perfect. And we, 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 we struggle with delegating. Jesus was perfect, and he delegated. And so that should be a great example for us, great leadership principle there. He was perfect. He didn't allow that perfection, in a sense, to keep him from doing what he needed to delegating to other people, delegating to the disciples. Then the uh, sixth principle that we see in the life of Jesus, and I, I hope this is helping. I, I, I know just preparing this message, this, this was helping me a lot in the new year. Sixth principle that we see in the life of Jesus, no greater example, is meditation. Meditation. Make, make a habit of personal prayer. So important, and, and, and I know what the pushback generally is. <laughs> I don't have time. Listen, 
let me just say, how's that working out for you because you're not praying? How, how's that working out for you? You know, I think it was Albert Einstein who said, if you keep doing the same thing and you expect different results, that's like the definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing and you expect different results. No, you're insane, fella. You're nuts. Meditation, make a habit of personal prayer. Again, we see this in the life of Jesus. Dealing with incredible pressure. People pulling on him, demanding this, demanding that. Religious leaders challenging him, saying you're a fraud, you're a fake, you're a phony. The Bible says, according to the scripture, that, that even his own family, with the, with the exception of Mary, his mother, even his own family didn't believe he was the son of God until after his resurrection. You know, and you do kind of believe your big brother might be God when he was crucified and he rises from the dead and then he walks through the wall. Uh, that's, uh, okay, Jesus, you got me. Big bro, son of God, you're God. But, but all kinds of pressure that he's dealing with, but Jesus took time to pray. Look at this, just, just absolutely fascinating. Again, an example for you and for me. Mark chapter one, verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Before daybreak, beginning of the day, just taking a little bit of time. I'm not talking about even a huge amount of time. Just maybe you don't pray at all. What, what difference would five minutes of prayer make? What, what difference would it make? Just, I've got a great little devotional uh, th that I use, and, and it's literally just, it's almost like just a half a page. It, it's so short. And, and I wake up in the morning, and I, and I read that, and, and then I take a little bit of time, and I read some of the scripture, and, and then I just take time just to pray. All in total, I guess it'd be 15 minutes. But you know what? Sometimes I get so busy, I'm like, I don't have time, and man, I feel that. I feel that later on in the day. Just, just a little bit of time. And Jesus sets the example. Before daybreak, he got up and he went out to an isolated place. Don't multitask pray. <laughs> don't, don't multitask this. It won't be effective. It won't help you nearly as much. Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Meditation. And then Psalm 46, verse 10 this is so important, I think. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We have to, we have to just calm down sometimes. We've got to make some, some space. We've got to create margin in our lives. Be still and know that I am God. I've heard it put this way before. This is pretty crazy. It's very true, though. It seems to be an ironic habit of man that when he loses his way, he doubles his speed. It seems to be an ironic habit of man that when he loses his way, he doubles his speed. I, I think for some of us, we're afraid of slowing down because we're afraid the reality of what's going on in our lives might actually come to the surface. And so we just keep going faster and faster. We try to go from one experience to the next experience to the next experience. And, and it's like, you know, you know, you can tell. A lot of folks, they walk into the house, if no one's there, they immediately have to turn on the music, turn on the radio, turn on something because they can't stand the silence. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I am God. In fact, let's just practice that right now. Let, let, let's just take 30 seconds and be still. That was 30 seconds immediate, just exactly 30 seconds. For some of you, I felt like it was three hours, didn't it? See, there's just something about like quieting our souls. Just, that was 30 seconds. Just, just quieting our souls 
quiet, peaceful. Sometimes, you know, uh, appreciate the staff. They got me a set of headphones uh, for my birthday back in November, and I'm, I'm just loving them. Sometimes I put them on. <laughs> Family thinks I'm listening to music. I ain't listening to nothing. I'm just drowning out everything else. I just put them on. No music playing. Just to just close my eyes, just to be still in God's presence. Be still and know that I am God. Meditation, making a habit of personal prayer. I, I don't believe in this new year, 2018, I, I don't believe that God wants us to double our speed because we've lost our way. Because we're so afraid of, of what the reality is, of what's going on inside of us, that we're just going faster and faster, running from it. Be still, make a habit of personal prayer. And, and then here's the, here's the seventh principle of coping with stress that we see in the life of Jesus. Recreation. Take time off to enjoy life. Take some time off and enjoy life. Life, and this is something I always joke about with our, our small group, you know. We talk about this sometimes in our community group and in my family, we've done it for years, you know. Most of us on vacation, we're even more busy on vacation than we are at work. And we come back from vacation exhausted. Man, I appreciated New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, I just had like the most chill New Year's Eve. Just quiet, relaxed, low-key. It was Awesome. Take time off and enjoy life. In, in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus says, it says, then he said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He's talking to the disciples. Do you see this rhythm that he showed us to live? Let's go off to a quiet place ourselves uh, and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat eat that's busy folks I mean Jesus was busy didn't even have time to eat but he recognized let's just let's just take a little time off let's just take a little break it's so important take time off to enjoy life rest and recreation in life is not an option they're essentials it's not an option. It's essentials. And, and, and here's the thing. You know, we go so hard. We go so fast. It's funny. We were talking about this recently with some folks. We we're talking about health and ways to improve our health. And, and they were saying, oh, you could try this diet and you could eat this way instead and all this stuff. And I said, here's an idea. What if we just started to rest one day a week the way God commanded us to? What if we just Worked six days, did, did busy, busy for six days, but we just went back to that, it's one of the Ten Commandments, by the way, honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy, that there's one day a week. Well, but we go so fast, we go so hard, what is it? We, we, we stay up too late, later than we should, and then we wake up and we need coffee, and so we gotta pump ourselves for the coffee during the day, and, and at night, we got so much stress, so much pressure, we need something to drink to help us to go to sleep. And it's just, just crazy, the pace. Jesus was going through this crazy pace and he says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while because they didn't even have time to eat. God created you and I to go hard for six days, but on the seventh day, rest. Stop. Recreate. Be refreshed. By the way, I talk sometimes about... Uh, word for the year. I always encourage people pray and seek God for a word like, a, not, not a bunch of, just one word. You know what my word is for this year? Refresh. <laughs> Refresh. Because a lot of what we're talking about, in answer to your question, how do I cope with stress? I, I'm not sure. The last two months of 2017, I did a real good job coping with some stress and pressure. And so my word is refresh, and, and that's be refreshed, but also just like on a, on a browser, on a website, when you hit the refresh button and it gives you a new, new perspective. And, and so, so when I feel the pressure mounting and all these things, I, I want to be able to pull back a little bit and just kind of hit that refresh button. Take a little different perspective on it. Recreation. It's interesting also, 
This is not from the life of Jesus, but this is in Scripture, so, so he lived it as well. He, he is the Word. He, he came and dwelt among us. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, watch this now, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. God is not a killjoy. God is not some sort of cosmic killjoy that's trying to stamp out your fun. God has given us everything that we need to enjoy. That's why he made the planet. That's why he made creation. We would enjoy it. And he enjoys seeing us enjoy it. And so it's so important. Take time off and enjoy life. And kind of catch your breath. And then here's the eighth Principle, really, real quick review. Identification, number one. Dedication, number two. Organization, number three. Concentration, number four. Number five, delegation. Six, meditation. Number seven, recreation. And and, and here's here's the eighth principle that we see in the life of Jesus. Transformation. Give your stress to Christ. Give your stress to Jesus. Give your pressure, give your stress to Jesus. I want to share with you now one of my favorite passages in the Bible, the words of Jesus. And it's just so beautiful. And I think he's speaking to the whole context. He's speaking to this exact context we're talking about, you and I, about how to cope with stress, how to cope with pressure. As we're looking at these principles to relieve the pressure in our lives. Look at this great promise that Jesus makes. Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. He says, if you'll come to me, if you're you're feeling overburdened and stressed under pressure, come to me, I'll give you rest. Rest. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. That's what Jesus wants to do for me. Goes on and says, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you. See, we've got to learn how to cope with stress. We've got to learn to live the rhythm that God created you and I to live in. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart and you will find rest. For your souls. He, he says, you, if you let me teach you, and, and hopefully that's what's happening today, and it's not just a one-time teaching, this is something we need to walk out all year long and in the future. If you'll let me teach you, you'll find rest for your souls. And he goes on and he says, for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you, it's light. It's not a heavy burden. It's light. And so he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the stress reliever. And Christ can transform your life right now, today, from stressful to satisfied, to peaceful. The greatest form of stress comes, the reality is, the greatest form of stress comes into our lives when we try to live our lives apart from God the one who made us. We're trying to be our own God and and, and we don't need him. Let me just ask you a question. How's that working out for you? Where's your peace? Where's your joy? It's not found running from him. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So what is it that you need? What is it that really every one of us needs most as we're starting off 2018? I think we need transformation. That only comes through Jesus Christ. And so I want to pray right now and just ask God and his love, his kindness, his grace, just to help us to live out these teachings this teaching about coping with stress, how to cope with stress, 
Jesus is the example. And, and if, if you've never prayed before and just received him as your Lord and your Savior, I, I, I want to end the prayer in just a minute. I'm going to pray and just lead you in a prayer that you can repeat after me. Opening up your heart to him for the first time. Receiving him as your Savior, as your Lord, because he wants to bring you peace. He says, come to me if you're weak and heavy laden, and I will give you peace. You'll find rest for your souls. Doesn't mean the circumstances change, but Jesus says, I'll change you in the middle of those circumstances. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the practicality of your word. Your word just instructs us. It teaches us in, in, in how to live godly, live the way that you want us to. Lord, thank you for the example of Jesus that showed us really how to cope with stress by identification, ded dedication, organization, concentration, delegation, meditation, recreation, and transformation. Lord, Lord, help us to learn from Jesus in the coming years, in the coming days, and the rest of this year. And Lord, to walk out and really deal with the stress, deal with the pressures that we all face in following the example that Jesus has set for us. Thank you, Lord. Right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if, if you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just want to encourage you right now, just open your heart to him right now. He said, come to me you're weak and heavy laden and you'll find rest and so I just want to lead you in a prayer right now and if you've never prayed it before you could just you could just repeat this after me opening your heart to him and putting your faith in Jesus Christ just pray now after me repeating saying dear Lord I believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross and that he rose again I repent of my sins and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. I believe because of his sacrifice for me, right now all my sins are forgiven through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I need to learn to allow you to transform my life and find rest for my soul. Jesus, lead me and guide me from this day forward. Amen. Amen.